So we're having another look at Heart of Darkness, uh, Conrad's novella, uh, which I made a first foray into last time. And uh, we have in this novella a, a very interesting study of um, obviously the practice of colonialism is the backdrop. I set that uh, context last time uh, with the context of the scramble for Africa in 1870. The European powers go into Africa and produce colonies there. This is after the abolition of the slave trade. And so uh, I think just from that vantage point, we need to see it a little bit differently than just about the uh, issue of slavery as much as that is a, uh, a live issue for the Europeans. Uh, for the United States and so forth uh, that dominates the discussions of these sorts of things. But there's more to it than that. It is a part of th this as well insofar as we can see what we clearly identify as racism in the novella, the language, uh, the worldview. That is there. Um, and I don't think there's any dispute that it's there. And for which reason, as I say, critics have taken it from both sides, have seen it as a text that displays colonialism and also one that critiques colonialism. And uh, I leaned on the latter side, um, that it's a critique of colonialism last time. But I think it's more than that. Um, but what it is, let me say, first of all, just as, as a sort of a framing for the whole, uh, for this choice of novella, uh, as my course material, as part of the curriculum for intro uh, to literature. Um, in this period, just the last few uh, classes, we've looked at Victorian era works. And uh, when we do that, we are um, brought into a mindset that's very much our own. Uh, I, I think when we look at Paradise Lost, we can see it uh, as Christians can see it, identify with it in certain ways. And I talked about the continuity of the themes and ideas of Milton's uh, grand epic based on, bib on the, the biblical story of the fall of mankind to that of the pagan epics, Homer and Virgil, and its con continuation in Dante. I've traced that throughout the course. Um, but when we come to the Victorian era, we start to get more of our contemporary sensibilities being brought to bear. And uh, with that, we start to identify uh, the way in which the novel frames the way we look at things. So we didn't look at Frankenstein in this course. I used to put Frankenstein on it, uh, but it was just a little bit too long. I thought it, at this point in the semester for first years, I noticed that people just weren't reading it. And um, I wanted to give you something that was at least possible. So I gave you Jekyll and Hyde. But in both cases, if I gave you Frankenstein or Jekyll and Hyde, you would have a sense of what I was talking about immediately. It's, all, it's, it's embedded in the cultural uh, frame of reference. Even for people who haven't read it, which is the majority of people, they, make, they say, oh, he's a real Jekyll and Hyde, or you know, it's a real Frankenstein scenario. Uh, I could call somebody a Scrooge, uh, and uh, everyone would know what I was talking about. And uh, if we talked about... Uh, detective fiction, uh, Sherlock Holmes type thing, immediately people would resonate with it. And again, uh, Dickens, Dickensian in London, everyone knows what that means because of the influence of these novels. It's just passed, even when people don't read them, it gets passed on into the cultural framework of reference. This one is likewise so, Heart of Darkness. Uh, although it's not usually referred to just uh, as a, a phrase that brings up associations, but still it looms over the landscape. And, and it's a classic, just like every work that I've done in the course so far. Uh, my question for you is, and I'm, I want to know what your thoughts on this are, because I'll, I'll come into my reasoning, but why do you think I put this on the course, this work on the course? I like this little picture here. Here's a heart, and then you have this spectral figure in the middle, and it's too small probably to see. Is that better? I don't know if it is any better. 
This is the text that we're looking at. But that's the picture. Covers, different covers. Never mind, don't get sidetracked by the covers. Why do you think I put this text on the course? I, I can choose any text I want. There's been a continuity of themes, and I've tried to build and talk about how certain works respond to previous works. Uh, sure. I'm not looking for, I mean, I have an answer, but I'm interested in what you think. Very good. So it's exploring human nature, is what you're saying, and some of the issues with that. And that has been certainly one of the, one of the areas of interest uh, throughout the course from the beginning, from back in Homer's Odyssey. And to some degree, that's what the epic itself presents, is a grand vision that connects humanity to the gods, the relationship of mankind to uh, greater powers than us. Uh, in Homer, it's the, the Greek gods, but even the Greek gods we saw are um, under the guidance of the fates. They can't depart from it. Uh, and it is, in that sense, a universe that is very hard and bitter for those who are, happen to be fated to, be, to do terrible things, like Oedipus and Oedipus Rex. He, sleeps with his mother, has children with her, commits incest, doesn't even mean to do that. And he is uh, going to suffer and fall for that. He's a tragic hero. He's the, not the hero in the sense that we seek to emulate him, but the hero in the sense that he's the main subject of interest. And the tragedy seems to be that the gods uh, are going to judge us uh, for things that were fated. And so human nature is uh, caught up in this problem of evil, which we seem to be uh, participate in whether we want to or not. And I don't think Oedipus wants to. He doesn't want to do a bad thing. He wants to do a good thing. He tries to avoid uh, the fate that has been prophesied. Uh, and so did his parents, and thereby brought it about. That's part of the fatalism there. And, and the tragedy, the sense of all human will to do better is thwarted by a reality that is, uh, as I say, not under our control. Um, so yes, yes, that's it. Uh, that's part of it. There seems to be a different uh, a change of point of view uh, as well. Come the Enlightenment, and then the Victorian period just builds on it. Anyone else have a response to that, by the way, the question again? Why did I choose this particular novella? I mean, you're not going to come up with all the answers that I had to consider. But when you have a curriculum for first year, I have a whole canvas of possibilities. I, there are a lot of books I would have liked to have put on here, but I just, you know, it's, I can't put everything on there, and it has to be s small enough to be readable. Yes? Yeah, um, so they were in here. You did? Okay, good. So, yeah, the last few novels in particular, which are in the Victorian era, um, in particular uh, dealt with the image that we like to cast for ourselves. So, again, Jacqueline Hyde and uh, Ivan Illich. 
the reality that we want to live in and sort of believe that we can will ourselves into and then there's the reality that we actually inhabit which doesn't really fit that picture and Tolstoy critiqued it by observing that this culture that wills itself into a better life can only do so at the reality of at the expense of uh, rejecting the reality of death which then comes to them anyway so it's a very existential category and I, as I say he, he talks about suffering and meaning the meaning of death but he he doesn't even talk about the cross which is an extraordinary thing uh, for a, a so, so-called Christian writer not to talk about the meaning of the death and resurrection of Christ he just talks about light and darkness which is I think a, a touching on it in a symbolic way but not really getting to their to the crux of the issue uh, and Jekyll and Hyde, you're right, how modern science, again, tries to control our reality. It's a sort of a, a technique, an instrument for us to use uh, to try and master our nature, our human nature. But interestingly, the mastery was in getting our, our sinful desires to be able to express them in a way that's under our control like we do with gambling or, or other forms of, you know, gambling used to be a absolute no-no in terms of uh, sports. Nowadays, you can bet on absolutely everything, you know, by the pitch or by the kick, who's going to touch, you know, every little, you can, you can bet on it. And uh, you would have thought the integrity of the game would be at stake because if somebody's going to make money off it, somebody's going to be willing to pay somebody to cheat, so that result comes, etc. Right? Um, but this idea of making reality conform to our wishes is very much um, been a discussion point for several classes, even going back to a modest proposal, right? And the horror that ensues, which is that people are seen as food which you can make, you can capitalize on, you can solve the problems of life by just make, making your reason an instrumental thing. It's a technique. So yes, those are, those are very good. And I think that there is something of that here. And the reason that Heart of Darkness, and again, this is the question that's been posed by those who are new critics of it and say it's a colonialist text is that it doesn't escape the conundrum of colonialism. It just pushes it into the belt. The Belgians are responsible for colonialism. I think that's where I left off last time. Let me see here. Go to, oh, we're gonna find the page number here. But he goes to Belgium, to Brussels, which he, he describes as a whitewashed sepulcher, biblical language, obviously referring to the Pharisees. Jesus calls them whitewashed sepulchers, right? But he goes there and he sees uh, a city that he is associating and, and clearly uh, marking as doing something morally reprehensible. It's associated with this, but, but not him, because he, he's, a, he's a Brit, and they're the Belgians, right? And uh, there are two women there dressed in black, and they're knitting. I don't know if you noticed that detail. Let's see if I can find this here. It's sort of hard on this page, doing it on this rather than a book, but I'm trying to put it on the screen for you here. I'm not going to find it. He's all the way in Central Station there, so I haven't quite got that. So, uh. Oh, no, we're already in Africa there. We don't want to be in Africa. There we go. Those about to die, we salute you. A knitler, an old knitter of black wool. She thought of these two, these two women who are knitting black, um, something in black. What is it? It's the, it's the, it's for the pall that will go over the, over the caskets when the people come back. So it's making a, an oblique reference to making a funeral shroud, just like Penelope did with the suitors, 
Remember Penelope said that she was going to, when, you know, I'll marry one of you. My husband's been away for 20 years and uh, I'm just, and as soon as I finish making a funeral pall for, the, for my uh, father-in-law, then I will marry one of you. And she knits it by day and then unknits it by night, right? And deceives the suitors. It goes on for three years. You would have thought they would catch on. Maybe the wine's particularly good. They don't really care that much. Maybe they don't want to marry her enough. I have no idea. Uh, but really, they don't want to marry her anyway. They just want to control the kingdom. And they're enjoying the fruits of that anyway. So who knows? And they catch her eventually. And we looked at that in relation to uh, the Lady of Shalotta as well. Again, a reference to it. And again, this is the way texts work intertextually. They make these sorts of references. But here they are doing this for the people that they send as missionaries. By the way, it's called a mission. And that's not accidental. It, we have a sense that uh, there is a missionary movement here, but it's not a Christian missionary movement. The mission is to get ivory. And so again, there's a, uh, to my mind, a clear criticism of the practice of sending people out in a colonialist enterprise to take what the bones of elephants, their tusks in particular, and bring them back to be a symbol of the culture and civilization. And to think that they're being civilized in the process, but they're sending them on a mission. Is this not a critique on Conrad's part of the language at the very least? I think it is. So in that sense, it's an obvious crit critique of colonialism. You know, you're whitewashing it <laughs> in the language of piety or morally, moralism or civilization, while at the same time you're doing something that isn't there to benefit the Africans, it's just to make yourselves wealthy. And those who are going on the mission are sort of like martyrs. And, and Con Conrad's Marlowe will be one such martyr because they think he's going to come back dead. Everyone else who they've sent out before has come back dead. And so they do, am among other things, they measure his skull. They want to take the cranial measurements because they, won't, they might not be able to identify him when he comes back. Note this. She seemed to know all about me and about, about them and about me too. An eerie feeling came over me. She seemed uncanny and fateful. Often far away, I thought of these two guarding the door of darkness. Knitting black wool is for a warm pall. One introducing, introducing con continuously to the unknown, the other scrutinizing the cheery and foolish faces with unconcerned old eyes. These are fates. They're the fates, the, the women. Ave, it's a greeting in Latin. Ave, old knitter of black wool. Morituri te salutant. Those who are about to die, we salute you. Not many of the, those she ever looked at ever saw her again. Not half by a long way. There was yet a visit to the doctor. A simple formality assured me the secretary with an air of taking an immense part in all my sorrows. Accordingly, a young chap wearing his hat over the left eyebrow, some clerk, I suppose. There must have been clerks in the business, though the house was still as a house in the city of the dead. He was shabby and careless with ink stains on the sleeves of his jacket and his cravat was large and billowy, you know, the neck scarf, under a chin shaped like the toe of an old boot. A little too early for the doctor, so I proposed a drink, as in alcohol. It's a little too early, well, let's have a shot. And then he says, I'm not such a fool as I look, quoth Plato to his disciples. He said, sententiously, empties his glass with great resolution, and we arose. The old doctor felt my pulse, evidently thinking of something else the while. Good, good for there, he mumbled. Good for there. Why good for there? You're not going to live there anyway. In other words, you're in bad health. You're in poor health. It's, it's a good pulse for there. He mumbled. And then with a certain eagerness asked me whether I would let him measure my head. Rather surprised, I said yes when he produced a thing like calipers and got the dimensions back and front in every way, taking notes carefully. He was an unshaven little man in a threadbare coat like a ga gabardine with a, his feet in slippers. And I thought him a harmless fool. 
I always ask leave in the interests of science to measure the crania of those going out there, he said. And when they come back too, I asked, oh, I never see them, he remarked. And moreover, uh, moreover, the changes take place inside, you know. This is the point that it's not, I can't measure what's going to happen to you when you go into this country because it's not going to be a physical change. That's not going to be what happens there. It's what happens inside to a person, a European who goes into Africa, who uh, goes in the name of power and exploitation and presumes himself to be civilized. What happens when he gets that power? And can you do with it what he will? He smiled as if some quiet joke. So you were going out there. Famous. Interesting too. Gave me a searching glance and made another note. Ever any madness in your family? He said in a matter of fact tone. I felt very annoyed. Is that question in the interest of science too? It would be, he said, without taking any notice of my irritation. Interesting for science to watch the mental changes of individuals on the spot. But are you an alienist? I interrupted. Every doctor should be a little, answered that original imperturbably. I have a little theory which you messieurs who go out there must help me to prove. This is my share in the advantages my country shall reap from the possession of such a magnificent dependency. The mere wealth I leave to others. Pardon my questions, but you are the first Englishman coming under my observation. I hasten to assure him I was not in the least typical. If I were you, said I, I would not, wouldn't be talking like this with you. What you say is rather profound and probably erroneous, he said with a laugh. Avoid irritation more than exposure to the sun. Adieu. How do you English say? Eh? Goodbye. Ah, goodbye. Adieu. In the tropics, one must have, before everything, keep calm. He lifted a warning forefinger, du calm, du calm. One more thing remained to do. Say goodbye to my excellent aunt. I found her triumphant. OK. So he announces that it, when he goes to the heart of darkness, he's going to become mad. In what sense is he going to become mad? But we're, we're, we're getting to, again, for those who just see this as a colonialist text uh, that is depicting the Africans as only so much chattel, like property. Or are they actually reading the text? I'm, I, I find it extraordinary. There's a lot more going on in the text than that. Uh, he is going to, uh, it's sort of a morbid fairy tale, is this uh, work. Uh, he's now enlisted for a Belgian trading company. Let me skip over this. Uh, and he wants to meet, and uh, I'll skip over this a little bit so that we can get on with the story. He wants to meet, and actually he is sent there to find this one individual by the name of Mr. Kurtz. Mr. Kurtz is the most successful harvester of ivory, although some question his, his uh, methods. But there's no, there's no doubting his success. He, he gets the ivory and he sends it back. And he is, in one sense, and this is how the novella depicts him, he is the flower of European civilization. It actually says in one spot that all Europe contributed to the making of Kurtz. So he is not just any old man. And he's, his name is Kurtz. And in German, the word Kurtz means short, by the way. It's little. I'm not saying he is physically low, but his, the, the description Kurtz by the Polish writer uh, probably is symbolic. Everything it, that European, the flower of European civilization is now shrunk. And he is going there uh, as the full representative of that. Now, what's interesting about that is um, he has gone silent. They don't know in, back in Brussels 
what has happened to Mr. Kurtz. They have not received any messages. And so he's being sent to go get him. Go find him, this man. And what we find is that when we get to Africa, everybody there uh, talks about him all the time. Constant gossip. He's like a celebrity. They gossip about him. They envy him. And with a very few exceptions, they loathe him. Can't stand him. I don't know if you noticed that when you were reading it, but they, they don't, they, but they also fear him. And the few exceptions to that include Mr. Marlowe. Marlowe admires him. So again, I said last time when we're looking at this novella and you want to look at narrative perspective, one of the things that is going to be, I, I talked about that he's not a, an omniscient narrator, but he's also a morally questionable narrator. And normally when we read stories, we think that the narrator means well or the protagonist is the good guy. And you would think with a colonialist narrative who's already critiqued the colonialism of the Belgians and he represents the English, that he, oh, we're on his side. Yeah, the English are not as savage as the Belgians. They do it better. But when you come to look more closely at what Marlowe is depicting, it's quite plain that Marlowe, by admiring Kurtz, is admiring a morally reprehensible character. Which make, means that he is a morally reprehensible character. And all that then begs the question of what is meant by the title of the novella, Heart of Darkness. What exactly is the heart of darkness? And how does it relate to what you were talking about earlier about the uh, human nature? Uh, when you get actually into Africa, it's, it's, a, it's a little vague, just like throughout the novella. And, and the, the vagueness is, is part of the whole landscape, the sort of the ambiance of it. Uh, it's, it's not clear exactly what Kurtz does. It's not, it's not stated explicitly, but it's, it's implicit and it's part of the whole atmosphere. Um, I think it's pretty clear that he kills people that oppose him. That's pretty obvious. He has sex with others, and, uh, and, and he steals all the ivory, basically. He keeps people in abject terror of him, and then does whatever he wants. And Marlowe admires him. Remember, he admires the efficiency. That's how he introduces the whole story, by the way, because the story is being told on the fishing yawl at the outset of the novella on the Thames River, and he says this too was once one of the dark places of the earth. So there's an element of admiring Kurtz and at the same time loathing Kurtz. And by admiring him and loathing him, there's an element of self-loathing that's in this, embedded in the whole story. He admires the thing that he also loathes. And what is that? It's European civilization. He's committed to it. He's all in. But using uh, power as an instrument is problematized in the story. And yet, is that not what the Victorians all do? We, well, we just looked at a series of Victorian novellas, whether they're written by English writers or by, or by Russians. It's part of the ambi ambiance of modernity, right? I, we could look at other works as well. I just selected a few shorter ones to make a broader point. And there's one other book that I should raise to your attention here, and I, I didn't put it on the course, and I haven't mentioned him thus far. But it is very much um, what we see exhibited in this story, and that is the writer Friedrich Nietzsche. Anyone read Nietzsche? A little bit. OK. What have you read? Remember? Snippets? Okay, that's okay. Um, so with Nietzsche, we will have a few phrases that come from his works. Nietzsche is a philosopher, linguist, a brilliant prose stylist in German, I have to say. Um, 
couple of phrases pass into the English language. One of them is the will to power. Right? You know that phrase. Another one's beyond good and evil. And and a third is connected with both of those. It's the idea of the Übermensch. Those three. You heard of those three. Um, all three of those are a direct consequence of the European Enlightenment and the postulate of and the use of reason as an instrument, not as a not as the whole principle of ultimate reality. Remember, in the Bible it says that in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were created by Him. So the Word, rationality, is intrinsic in the universe. This is the way reality works. The medieval period is thoroughly rational. It sees the, the order and the purpose and the meaning of the, of the cosmic, cosmically ordained natural reality that we call creation. God's reason is there. And the heavens declare it, and so does the earth. Psalm 19, you can talk about the heavens declare the glory of God. And all of the created order has a rationality to it because it's been made by the Logos of God. We can reason about it, we can speak about it, we can understand it. Modern science focuses not on the purposes of the creation, but on how we can use reason as an instrument to try and exploit it to gain power over nature. This is the shift that comes with Descartes. I talked about that, right, the cogito. I'm gonna doubt everything. I'm gonna doubt absolutely everything in order to gain certainty, but the certainty is the certainty that I build from myself outward. In order, and then this is the outcome of modern science, to do experiments on that reality so I can get power over it and exploit it and use it for certain purposes, right? And Nietzsche then comes as a late critic of this product and there are project and there are others alongside him. One's called Karl, Mar Karl, Karl Marx. Try that again. Das Kapital, it's a critique of the material way of looking at things. Uh, another is uh, Freud who is also going to cast doubt on the motivations for this. He thinks that there's a psychological motivation. He'll reread some of the texts that we, we've looked at so far. I'm a critique of all three men, by the way, Marx, uh, Nietzsche, and Freud. They're all suspicious of the motives for actions, and they are masters of doubt. Nietzsche reduces everything to the will to power, and Kurtz is a representative of that man. He's also an Ubermensch. He's also be placed himself beyond good and evil. So if you wanted to see as a backdrop for this, a, a way of looking at this, Nietzsche is very useful, I think. Let me uh, explain the word Ubermensch. And I also mentioned last time Darwinism, right? And Darwinism posits that we originate in a lower form of life and gradually build on that and become more and more advanced. And we're at the pinnacle of that. Where each generation gets more and more advanced. It doesn't say where we're going, by the way. It just says that we are. It's, a, it's its theory. You can't, you can't actually contest the theory because it doesn't actually say what the future looks like. It's just better than it was. Just like your tech, technological devices, your smartphones are better than they were 10 years ago. I mean, they don't even work now. They're bricks on the internet, right? They can't even. But that's what being human is like. We're superior. What came before us is inferior. We can disavow it. It's getting better. It's the narrative progress that can't be contested. But he is the Übermensch. Now, what is the Übermensch? It's, it's, it's not actually a word in English or in German, even. He makes it up. Or maybe he gets it from in mountaineering. In Switzerland, you know, they've got big mountains. And the Übermensch is the, if you think of a way that you used to climb up mountains, you haven't done it yourself, but you've seen it, where they pound with a hammer a, a spike into the rock of the cliff and then string a rope through it and two people go up and the one on the top is the Übermensch. 
The people down below, by the way, are the Untermenschen as a result. Now the Untermenschen are like slaves. They're the herd, they're the rest of society, and the Übermensch is the one who's pulling everybody else up by the, his will to be not part of the herd. It's his desire to be great and to not be connected to this mass of humanity that he seems to be connected with. But he is the one leading them forward. We ought to follow the Übermensch. Nietzsche probably sees himself as one. Hitler used this text to justify Nazi Germany, by the way. They were the, the uh, Aryans were the Übermenschen, or they would be if they followed his orders and did what was necessary to do, which is to stop feeling sorry for the Untermenschen. Who are the Untermenschen? Who are the subhumans? In Nazi Germany, who are the subhumans? Yes. The Jews. Who else? Yep. Yes. Sorry? The Roma, the Gypsies, the Slavs. All of these people were clearly not as evolved. How can we demonstrate they're not as evolved? Well, they don't have the uh, culture that we do. Right? They, they benefit from our culture. They come here, they benefit from our culture, but they don't actually participate in it. And, uh, and so the, I'm talking about a mindset now. I'm not talking about a specific instance, but Kurtz represents the flower of European civilization. All Europe, it says, says Conrad, contributed to the making of Kurtz. And all Europe is represented then in what he represents to Conrad. Not Marlowe. Marlowe idolizes him. But Conrad, the novelist, Conrad is not to be confused with Marlowe, the character. Marlowe is his character. He's the main character. He's the one we follow. Does Conrad mean us to admire Marlowe? I don't think so. Not, you don't depict a man this way with as many questions surrounding his judgment as Conrad presents it. If you really mean him to be our hero, if you will. But he does represent a mentality of the British, that they're better than the, the Belgians, and that the whole, never mind the British versus the Belgians, the whole European mindset is about being Übermenschen. By the way, the Nazis were not the only ones that were committed to the eugenics movement, because that's what Nazism comes out of. It's a certain s form of social Darwinism. So, because here's the question, if hum humanity has evolved from lower forms of life, the primates, the monkeys, and so forth, and it's becoming something superior, and yet you can notice differences in civilizations, different types of people, then which is the master race? How will you know at the end of the day? Yes, who was ever left alive. That's exactly it. Because the rest are going to demonstrate that they are not fit to survive. First, we will name them as unworthy forms of life. Nazis explicitly call that unwerdiges, unworthy life, an unworthy form of life. It's the language of the eugenics movement. It's the language of euthanasia right now, by the way. Because the euthanasia movement comes out of the eugenics movement, and so does abortion for that matter. We determine what a worthy form of life is. We use technology as an instrument to gain power over nature, and we feel ourselves emancipated from it, like the Übermenschen. By the way, the Übermenschen doesn't have to be a man. It can be a woman. You can also, you can also spread it out so that people can gain the power over their own nature and call it your identity. I'm gaining power over myself by identifying myself as this, that, or the next thing. I'm gaining power over my own nature. Does that problem escape the problem that Marlowe depicts 
in his own walk of life and Conrad describes throughout the novella, namely the heart of darkness. So there's again, there's a, it's, it's like a moth to a flame. He desires it and it's going to destroy him, just like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Just like, I think, in A Modest Proposal. Here's a civilization that's committed to a certain thing and it does so at the expense of its own humanity. Uh, he goes up the steamer, meets a man in the suite. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. But let's get a little depiction here. of This is the sort of thing that the Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe critiqued here, which is the depiction of the Africans. It says that they're, they're uh, presented in animalistic fashion. They're not admirable. They have no moral nature at all. A slight clanking behind me made me turn my head. Six black men advanced in a file, toiling up the path. They walked erect and slow, balancing small baskets of earth on their heads, and the clink kept them with their footsteps. Black rags were wound round their loins, and the short ends behind raggled to and fro like tails. I could see every rib. The joints of their limbs were like knots in a rope. Each had an iron collar on his neck, and all were connected together with a chain whose bites swung before them, rhythmically clinking. Another report from the cliff made me think suddenly of that ship of war I'd seen firing into a continent. By the way, this is a depiction of the futility of, of imperialism to some degree. There's a ship that's taking, uh, blasting its cannons into the jungle for no apparent reason. It's like Western civilization. Uh, under the European Enlightenment uh, against nature, taking shots, like warning shots. We said it was the same kind of ominous voice, but these men could by no stretch of imagination be called enemies. They were called criminals because these are prisoners there. They've got chains on their feet. That's why there's clinking, right? They've got Manacles on their hands, probably, but definitely on their feet, keeping them walking in a row. And it's the, they're going to fall down if they step too far, right? Because the feet are chained together. They were called criminals, not enemies. And the outrage law, like the bursting shells, had come to them an insoluble mystery from the sea. All their meager breasts panted together, the violently dilated nostrils quivered, the eyes stared stonily uphill. They passed me within six inches without a glance, with that complete death-like indifference of unhappy savages. Behind this raw matter, one of the reclaimed, the product of the new forces at work, strolled despondently carrying a rifle by its middle. He had a uniform jacket with one button off and seeing a white man on the path, hoisted his weapon to his shoulder with alacrity. He acted white disciplined, ordered, put on the show. This was simple prudence, white men being so much alike at a distance that he could not tell who I might be. He was speedily reassured and with a large white rascally grin and a glance at his charge seemed to take me into partnership in his exalted trust. After all, I also was a part of the great cause of these high and just proceedings. Civilizations on trial, the Africans are on trial. They're criminals. What crime have they committed? Who knows? It's not said. It doesn't matter. You're on the side of the advance of civilization. And how do we know that we're advancing? Because we've got the power. Instead of going up, I turned and descended to the left. My idea was to let that chain gang get out of sight before I climb the hill. You know, I'm not particularly tender. I've had to strike and defend off. I've had to resist and to attack sometimes. That's only one way of resisting without counting the exact cost, according to the demands of such sort of life as I had blundered into. I've seen the devil of violence and the devil of greed and the devil of hot desire. But by all the stars, these were strong, lusty, red-eyed devils that swayed and drove men. Men, I tell you, but as I stood on the, this hillside and foresaw that in the blinding sunshine of that land, 
I could be acquainted with a flabby, pretending, weak-eyed devil of a rapacious and pitiless folly. How insidious he could be, too, I was only to find out several months later and a thousand miles further. What's he referring to? When he meets Kurtz. Just how morally beyond good and evil. So the, again, this is what marks the Ubermensch, by the way, is that he is not only connected to his disconnected from his fellow human beings, the Untermensch, on the rope that he's pulling upwards, he thinks that he should not be constrained by categories of right and wrong, good and evil. We're beyond good and evil. He should express the will to power and ignore right and wrong. Never mind justice. This is obeying the law of power. Does Conrad critique this mentality or does he demonstrate it in its contradictions? Or does he do both? He does both. He could just say there and say, that's wrong, you shouldn't treat the natives like this. He, so you could have a virtue signaling protagonist in there that went about in, in the context of late Victorian period who was saying that's wrong. That's what the modern educators would like us to do. We'd have somebody there who was tut-tutting and saying you shouldn't do that and don't you know all men are brothers, etc. That wouldn't make for a very good novella. That's not how stories work. It's, he, he's using irony. He's using uh, symbolic language. He's re using religious language. In fact, he's accusing them of grand hypocrisy for using religious language to whitewash horrible, horrible deeds that actually don't even appeal to justice. They simply appeal to power and civilization that have no moral categories that even apply to them anymore. Any comments about this? He moves on. Having just said they're not, they're, they're not enemies, they're criminals. What does he say? They were dying slowly, it was very clear. They were not enemies, they were not criminals. Contradicts what he just said. They were nothing earthly now. Nothing but black shadows of disease and starvation. Lying confusedly in the greenish gloom brought from all the recesses of the coast and all the legality of time contracts, lost in uncongenial surroundings, fed on unfamiliar food. They sickened, became inefficient. Remember he talked about the importance of efficiency. It's what distinguishes us from the Romans. Became inefficient and were then allowed to crawl away and rest. These moribund shapes were free as air and nearly as thin. I began to distinguish the gleams of the eyes under the trees. Then glancing down, I saw a face near my hand. The black bones reclined at full length with one shoulder against the tree and slowly the eyelids rose and the sunken eyes looked up at me, enormous and vacant, a kind of blind white flicker in the depths of the orbs which died out slowly. The man seemed young, almost a boy, but you know, with them, it's hard to tell. Who's the with, with them? Is it with the Africans? Is it with this particular group of individuals that are so emaciated that you can see that they're called black bones? There's nothing but a skeleton left, pretty much. Still alive, but barely. How can you tell how old a person is when, all they, when they look like old men? Or is he making a more general description? The whole narrative is cloaked in language that makes it unclear exactly where the narrator stands on it. And that's because, again, even his narrative, that is uh, Marlowe's, isn't making moral judgments. Or not in the sense that everyone is subject to the same, what C.S. Lewis will call the Tao, the, the uh, law of human nature. It doesn't apply. He doesn't see, see that there's a common humanity. Lewis describes that, by the way, in that work, which uh, you'll eventually read here at Tyndale, in The Abolition of Man. You should read it before you come to that, actually. Read it for summer reading. 
He talks about the effect of an education that ignores moral considerations as creating men without chests. There's no, they're not taught to understand that there is one moral law under which every person is subject. They think that they're above that, they're the ubermenschen, and they can kick away good and evil and right and wrong. They'd be beyond good and evil. Let's be like that. That's what, he's, that's what Marlowe's depicting. So the critique of colonial, colonialism, to my mind, could not be more sharp. But look, he tied a bit of white worsted round his neck. Why? Where did he get it? Was it a badge, an ornament, a charm, a propitiatory act? Was there any idea at all connected with it? It looked startling around his black neck this bit of white thread from beyond the seas. What is its meaning? It has no meaning. It doesn't come down on it. It's because it's, it, this is a framework in which the powerful can come in and can subjugate the locals without any moral considerations and be worshipped as gods. They got guns. The whole novella is like this. Let me come to part two. There it is. He's going up, as I said, this is depicted in, uh, in various ways in film. Have a look at, again, um, the African queen, if you will. Um, but you can also see it depicted in Apocalypse Now. It's set then in Vietnam. There's the American form of Heart of Darkness to the point of they call them by the same names and they have the same dialogue. So it's just a retelling of Heart of Darkness. It's saying something there in the case of the Vietnam War about America's own sort of colonialism, even though they have no colonies. How do they, exp how do they treat the world around them? Is it not part of a whole mindset? A, uh, post-Christian mindset. I hate the phrase, by the way. Never stop hearing it. Can't stand it. There's no such thing. It's either Christian or it's anti, not post. Can't be after Christian. There's a, Christ there's a Christian mindset, and then there's all those that deny that it is, uh, it is what it is. But post-Christian is describing Victorian, the Victorian uh, and the Enlightenment worldview. It's already post-Christian. It says that Christian categories of right and wrong related to human nature are invalid, don't even apply. That's post-Christian. It's not some fad from the 21st century. It's already saying Christian truth, not true. There is no law of human nature. But he's on the steamboat and he's going upriver and he is going towards Mr. Kurtz. And they had been talking about Kurtz. And as he goes up the river, he gets, well, he's going into the jungle. So it's dark. And there's an irony there. It's so dark because it's so bright, actually. The, the sun's light is so hot and so intense that it allows the jungle to grow up. Right? It's because of the light, not because it's a dark place. But because of the shade of the jungle, it becomes dark beneath that, the canopy of, of the green trees. I was broad awake by this time. You've been in that situation probably. It doesn't get that hot here in Canada. Maybe some days where it's so sultry and hot that, you know, the humidity is 100% and it's just blazing sun. You imagine that all the time in the 40s, 50s. Probably never hits the 50s, but just, and, and just so much water and humidity that it rains all the time, which just creates even more of the same. I was broad awake by this time, but lying perfectly at ease, as you do when it's very hot. You don't want to move. Remaining still, having no inducement to change my position. How did that ivory come all this way, growled the elder man, who seemed very vexed. The other explained that it had come with a fleet of canoes in charge of an English half-caste clerk Kurtz had with him that Kurtz had apparently intended to return himself, the station being uh, by that time bare of goods and stores, but after coming 300 miles, had suddenly decided to go back. 
which he started to do alone in a small dugout with four paddlers, leaving the half caste to continue down the river with the ivory. The two fellows there seemed astounded at anybody attempting such a thing. They were at loss for an adequate motive. Why would he not come back with the ivory? Why would anyone do such a thing? That's the whole purpose of life is to get the ivory. They're totally motivated by the cause, the grand cause of getting ivory and being civilized, even though civilization now means nothing. They still cling to the white veneer of the ivory as if it were different than the black ebony keys from the ebony wood. Is it just a black and white difference? Because that's how they pretty much see it. How can you not be committed to the white? As to me, this is now Marlowe, I seem to see Kurtz for the first time. It was a distinct glimpse. The dugout, so it's a canoe dug out of a piece of wood. That's the type of canoe, it's not birch bark. The dugout for paddling savages and the lone white man turning his back suddenly on the headquarters on relief on thoughts of home, perhaps, setting his face towards the depths of the wilderness, towards his empty and desolate station. I did not know the motive. Perhaps he was just simply a fine fellow who stuck to his work for its own sake. His name, you understand, had not been pronounced once. He was that man. Why did they call him that man? Because they hate him. Everybody hates him. That man. The half-caste, by the way, note, note the racial descriptions here. He's a half caste. The caste system of a hierarchy, you stay in your place. It's not just the whites and the blacks. There's a whole, he's a half breed. I guess he's part white, part black. I have no idea, but he's a half caste. Who, as far as I could see, had conducted a difficult trip with great prudence and pluck was invariably alluded to as that scoundrel. Everybody hates Kurtz and his people. The scoundrel had reported that the man had been very ill, had recovered imperfectly. The two below me moved away then a few paces and strolled back and forth at some little distance. I heard, military post, doctor, 200 miles, quite alone now, unavoidable delays, nine months, no, no news, strange rumors. They approached again, just as the manager was saying, no one as far as I know, unless a species of wandering trader, a pestilential fellow snapping ivory from the natives. Who was it they are talking about now? I gathered in snatches that this was some man supposed to be in Kurtz's district and of whom the manager did not approve. We will not be free from unfair competition till one of the, these fellows is hanged for an example. Who is the man? Can you guess? Probably Kurtz. They're going to hang him. Why are they going to hang him? He's not working for them anymore. He's plundering the ivory, but he's not doing it for the cause. He's doing it for himself. But he goes back also because he's deathly sick. Certainly get him hanged. Why not? Anything, anything can be done in this country. That's what I say. Nobody here, you understand, here can endanger your position. And why? You stand the climate. You outlast them all. The danger is in Europe. But there, before I left, I took care to, they moved off and whispered, and then their voices rose again. The extraordinary series of delays is not my fault. I did my best. The fat man sighed, very sad. And the pestiferous absurdity of his talk, continued the other, he bothered me enough when he was here. Each station should be like a beacon on the road towards better things, a center for trade, of course, but also for humanizing, improving, instructing. Conceive you, that ass. And he wants to be manager? No, it's... And he got choked up by excessive... But note that they are talking about the uh, ivory trade as now a mission. And the blaze of civilization, just like the torches going forward, the light into the darkness... They go all the way up. Oh, here you come. Marlowe again admires this man. 
crawling slowly towards Kurtz. Prehistoric man was cursing us, praying to us, welcoming us. Who could tell? We were cut off from the comprehension of our surroundings. We glided past like phantoms. Remember they just referred to the black skeletons as phantom-like? They are becoming like that themselves. They're losing their humanity. As they go further and further into the darkness, we are, the earth seemed unearthly. We are accustomed to look upon the shackled form of a conquered monster. But there, there you could look at a thing monstrous and free. It was unearthly. And the men were, no, they were not inhuman. Well, you know, that was the worst of it. This suspicion of their not being inhuman. It would slowly come to me. What are we seeing? We're seeing him lose his mind. Marlowe is losing his mind, just like it was depicted in the station. People go there and they lose all moral compass. They can't judge rightly. They can't see straight. But he admires Kurtz and he wants to get there. On he goes, on he goes. As they get closer and closer, they finally will get to see Mr. Kurtz. It's very serious, said the manager's voice behind me. I would be desolated if anything should happen to Mr. Kurtz before we came up. I looked at him and had not the slightest doubt he was sincere. He was just the kind of man who would wish to preserve appearances. He's happy being a hypocrite. He wants to keep the surface appearance. That was his restraint. But when he muttered something about going on at once, I did not even take the trouble to answer him. I knew and he knew that it was impossible. Were we to let go our hold of the bottom, we would absolutely be in the air in space. In other words, they're like the Uber mansion. There's no rope anymore to ground them. They are totally, they are, they are Uber mansion in Africa. That's what they are. But they've cut themselves off from the moral law and now they're falling. They're in free fall. I did not think that the natives would attack for several obvious reasons. The thick fog was one. If they left the bank in their canoes, they'd get lost in it, and as would we if we attempted to move. Still, I had also judged the jungle of both banks quite impenetrable, and yet eyes were in it, eyes that had seen us. The riverside bushes were certainly very thick, but the undergrowth behind it was evidently penetrable. And you should have seen the pilgrims stare. Again, pilgrim, pilgrims, Christian language. They had no heart to grin and, or even to revile me, but I believe they thought me gone mad, with fright maybe, irony. I delivered a regular lecture. My dear boys, it was no good bothering. Keep a lookout. Well, you may guess I watched the fog for the signs of lifting as a cat watches a mouse. But for anything else, our eyes were of no more use to us than if we'd been buried miles deep in a heap of cotton wool. I felt like it too, choking, warm, stifling. And they come closer to closer to Kurtz's station. I need to get to the encounter here properly. Suppose Mr. Kurtz is dead by well at this time. No, he is not. And now the narrator comes in and he describes Marla from the outside. There was a, uh, a uh, pause of profound, give me some tobacco, pause of profound silence, then a match flared and Marlowe's lean face appeared. The fire lights his face so he can see it. Worn, hollow, with downward folds, dropped eyelids, with an aspect of concentrated attention, and as he took vigorous draws at his pipe, it seemed to retreat in advance out of the night in the regular flicker of tiny flame. The match went out. Absurd, he cried out. This is the worst of trying to tell. Here you all are, each moored with two good addresses, like a hulk with two anchors, a butcher round one corner, a policeman round another, excellent appetites, and temperature normal. You hear normal from year's end to end to year's end. And you say absurd. Absurd be exploded absurd the word absurd means irrational right it's it's it makes no sense according to any you call it absurd 
and you, yet you still have the trappings of civilization. So here's a man who is, is angered at everyone else's total loss of moorings around him. My dear boys, what can you expect from a man who was out of sheer nervousness and had just flung overboard uh, a pair of new shoes? I was cut to the quick at the idea of having lost the inestimable privilege of listening to the gifted Kurtz. By this point, it's just idol worship. He, he represents him, Marlowe. He admires him. This is what he's like. He wants to be there. I laid the ghost of his gifts at last with a lie, he began suddenly. Girl, what? Did I mention a girl? Oh, she's out of it completely. They, the woman I mean, are out of it, should be out of it. We must help them to stay in the beautiful world of their own, lest ours gets worse. Oh, she had to be out of it. You should have heard the disinterred body of Mr. Kurtz saying, my intended. A woman back in Europe who he's left behind. He's got a mistress there, but there's a woman he's going to marry back in Europe. His intended, what we come, I'm not gonna get to it probably because of my dallying here. Um, but his head's like an ivory ball. Fascinating description here. Again, the little subtle ways in which he's, um, and he's thinking about Kurtz. And he's thinking of him in terms of the will to power. Let me read this. By the simple exercise of our will, we can exert a power for good practically unbounded, etc., etc. From that point, he soared and took me with him. The peroration, so the conclusion of his speech, was magnificent, though difficult to remember, you know. It gave me the, sort, the notion of an exotic immensity ruled by an august benevolence. It made me tingle with enthusiasm. This was the unbounded power of eloquence, of words, of burning noble words. There, was, there were no practical hints to interrupt the magic current of phrases, unless a kind of note at the foot of the last page, evidently scrawled evidently much later, in an unsteady hand might be regarded as an exposition of a method. It was very simple. And at the end of that moving appeal, to every altruistic sentiment, it blazed at you, luminous and terrifying, like a flash of lightning in a serene sky. Exterminate all the brutes. There's what he wrote. Kill them all. And who is moved by this? Marlowe. So moved. As, at the goodness of this. August benevolence, power. He calls it my pamphlet, as it's sure to have in the future a good influence upon his career. Exterminate all the, boot, all the brutes. And then we see a slow process, and I am going to have to come to this, and I'm going to struggle to find it here. It's so slow in its depiction. I guess it's in three. But you can see uh, Kurtz has now become a megalomaniac and is willing to kill everybody around him. And Marlowe admires him. And this is his manifesto. As well. After all of this, he's going to gain power simply by killing all those around him. The brutes. He, knows, he sees no humanity between himself and the African men he sees there. They managed to nurse Kurtz through two illnesses, but as a rule, Kurtz wandered alone far in the depths of the forest. Very often coming to the station, I had to wait days and days before he would turn up, he said. Ah, it was worth waiting for, sometimes. What was he doing? Exploring or what? I asked. Ah, yes. Of course, he discovered lots of villages and a lake too. He did not know exactly in what direction. It was dangerous to inquire too much but mostly his expeditions had been for ivory. But he had no goods to trade with by that time, I objected. There's a, lot of, there's a good lot of cartridges left even yet, he answered, looking away. He doesn't trade with them anymore. He says, give me, the, give me the ivory or else. And they give him the ivory. There's the trade. I won't kill you. He's not giving them cartridges for rifles they don't have. He's saying, I will take it by force. 
To speak plainly, he raided the country, I said. He nodded. Not alone, surely. He muttered something about the villages around the lake. Kurt's got the tribe to follow him, did he? I suggested. He fidgeted a little. They adored him. He said the tone of these words was so extraordinary that I looked at him searchingly. It was a, curious to see his mingled eagerness and reluctance to speak of Kurtz. The man filled his life, occupied his thoughts, swayed his emotions. What can you expect, he burst out. He came to them with thunder and lightning, you know, and they had never seen anything like it and very terrible. He could be terrible. You can't judge Mr. Kurtz as you would an ordinary man. No, no, no. Now, just to give you an idea, I don't mind telling him he wanted to shoot me too one day, but I don't judge him. Shoot you? I cried, what for? Well, I had a small lot of ivory the chief of that village near my house gave me. You see, I used to shoot game for them. Well, he wanted it and wouldn't hear reason. He declared he would shoot me unless I gave him the ivory and then cleared out of the country because he could do so and had a fancy for it. And there was nothing on earth to prevent him killing whom he jolly well pleased. And it was true too. I gave him the ivory. No, no, I couldn't leave him. I had to be careful, of course, until we got friendly again. Then he had his second illness, etc., And he suffered so much. Why, he's mad, I said. He protested indignantly. Mr. Kurtz couldn't be mad. If I'd heard him talk only two days ago, I wouldn't dare dent at such a thing. Up he looks. This is too fake. The admirer of Mr. Kurtz was a little crestfallen. In a hurried, indistinct voice, he began to assure me he had not dared to take these symbols down. What are the symbols? They're of the heads of the tribesmen on poles as a warning. He hadn't dared to take them down. A man like this with such ideas, shamefully abandoned by everyone else, he's the, he's the victim. The man admires him and sees that people have not supported him. They're opposed to him. He's been victimized. Kurtz, I haven't slept for the last 10 nights. His voice lost itself in the, the calm of evening. They all go mad. Okay, so now comes the woman who is his mistress. She walked with measured steps, draped in a striped and fringed cloth, treading the earth proudly with a slight jingle and flash of barbarous ornament. She carried her head high. Her hair was done in the shape of a helmet. She had brass leggings to the knee, brass wire gauntlets to the elbow, a crimson spot on her tawny cheek, innumerable necklaces of glass beads on her neck, bizarre things, charms, gifts of witch men that hung about her, glittered and trembled at every step. She must have had the value of several elephant tusks upon her. She was savage and superb, wild-eyed and magnificent. There was something ominous and stately in her deliberate progress. And in the hush that had fallen suddenly upon the whole sorrowful land, the immense wilderness, the colossal body of the fecund and mysterious life seemed to look at her pensive as if though it had been looking at the image of its own shadowy, tenebrous and passionate soul. On she comes and she comes to Marlowe. And she said, if she'd offered to come aboard, I think I should have shot her, said the man in patches. And at this moment, I heard Kurtz's deep voice behind him, behind the curtain. Save me. Save the ivory, you mean. Don't tell me. Save me. Why, I've tried to save you. You're interrupting my plan. Sick, sick. The manager comes out. He's very low, very low. Nevertheless, I think Mr. Kurtz is a remarkable man, I said with an emphasis. He started, dropped on me a heavy glance, said very quietly, he was. And he will sit there and he will sit there and we will watch the slow process of Kurtz dying. And eventually he does die. Where will we come? I had immense plans. He muttered irresolutely. Irresolu yes, said I, but if you, tried, if you try to shout, I'll smash your head with it was not a stick or a stone near. I will throttle you for good, I corrected myself. I was on the threshold of great things. He pleaded in a voice of longing and a wit wistfulness of tone that made my blood run cold. And now for this stupid scoundrel. Your success in Europe is assured in any case, I affirmed steadily. I did not want to have the throttling 
of him you understand, and indeed it would have been very little use for any practical purpose. It's talking about the man's soul. If anyone ever struggled with the soul, I am the man. But I wasn't arguing with a lunatic either. Believe me or not, his intelligence was perfectly clear, concentrated as true upon himself, with horrible intensity yet clear, and therein was my only chance. Barring, of course, the killing him there and then, which wasn't so good on account of the unavoidable noise. No, he doesn't want to not kill Kurtz because it's wrong to kill a man, but because he would make noise. And by making noise, he would turn the others on him. But he's happy to kill him. Kurtz discourse. By this point, he's not a body, he's just a voice. A voice. A disembodied voice, like Europe which he represents. Was he rehearsing some speech in his sleep or a fragment of phrase from some newspaper article? For the furthering of my ideas, it's a duty. His was an impenetrable darkness, the heart of darkness. His was an impenetrable darkness. I looked at him as you peer down at a man who is lying at the bottom of a, of a precipice where the sun never shines. But I had not much time to give him because I was helping the engine driver to take the pieces. And it, at his last, anything, that, anything approaching the change that came over his future I had never seen before and hope never to see again. Oh, I wasn't touched. I was fascinated. It was as though a veil had been rent, the veil of the temple, the curtain from the Holy of Holies, right, in the temple. It was, I was fascinated. I saw on that ivory face the expression of somber pride, of ruthless power, of craven terror, of an intense and hopeless despair. Did he live his life again in every detail of desire, temptation, and surrender during that supreme moment of complete knowledge? He cried in a whisper at some image, at some vision. He cried out twice, a cry that was no more than a, a breath. The horror, the horror. I blew the candle out and left the room. He dies like this, I, out he goes. And then a boy comes in, manager's boy, put his insolent black head in the doorway and said in a tone of scathing contempt, Mr. Kurtz, he dead. And the pilgrims rush in to see. Who are the pilgrims? They're the pilgrims of the cult of Mr. Kurtz, the, the natives there. The portrait of the heart of darkness is a portrait of Europe. I'm gonna answer my question. It's the portrait of Europe with the Enlightenment as its means of understanding the world without any sense of the purpose of reasoning that is connected with moral considerations. It's, it's abandoned the Christian faith that uses the Christian language, but it does not in any way represent Christianity. But it is the way in which modernity goes. And I, I think that uh, Conrad is a, an extraordinary critic of it. He is not a colonialist, or if he is, he's a <laughs> he is speaking within the camp to demonstrate how horrible the whole colonialist enterprise is. That's my take on it at any rate. Uh, anyway, we're done. Sorry, overshot the time a little bit.